continuing our study from the Chronological Bible. That's the Tyndale version and the particular one that I have it happens to be the New Living Translation. Uh, but uh, I've also been studying from my New American Standard as I've been going through. Uh, remember that we've uh, finished up David's life with 1 Kings chapter 2 and we're starting to look at uh, the Psalms that he's attributed to have written. Um, uh, about 73 psalms, 72 psalms that he's uh, been attributed to have written and we've uh, studied some during the time that we were studying 2nd Samuel uh, but we left off with uh, Psalm 34 last yesterday and uh, we're going to continue but I thought this was a good place to say that as I've been looking at this living translation uh, they have markings called interludes, and the interludes are really the same thing as Selah, uh, S-E-L-A-H, uh, which is uh, a pause or a silent period. Uh, as John Phillips says, it's a time for the reader to say to themselves uh, that the writer would have been saying, what do you think about that? So it's a time to meditate or to think about what the writer has just said and not to move on until you've meditated on what he's just said. I think that's a good explanation for it. And we also talked about superscripts, that is some of the information above the psalm uh, that is found in many of the study Bibles. And uh, we don't know exactly when those and some of the other notes for psalms uh, were added to the Psalms or whether they were there from the very beginning. Uh, remember the Psalms were written over a long period of time uh, and a collection of Psalms uh, uh, represents time from 1410 BC all the way down to 430 BC. And of course David's Psalms would have been between 1011 and 971 uh, BC. So we we have a long period of time and these could have been added or they could have been the original notations. Uh, but uh, we know that they went back as far as the Aleppo uh, Codex of 930 AD. That's a thousand years after Christ. So we, we know they were there a thousand years after Christ uh, on the Psalms. There's a number of other terms that uh, besides the interlude or silas and the superscripts at the beginning of the Psalms that you may have in a study Bible. And uh, those are like Alamoth, um, Mescal, um, uh, Shemeth. Uh, uh, many of these notations are like a soprano was to sing, um, or this was a harvest song, or uh, this was to be played with um, stringed instruments. And so you may see a bunch of other words uh, that uh, are there. Most of them uh, are just telling you how it's to be played, how it's to be sung, with what instruments it's to be sung. And uh, you can look up those words individually. They're well covered uh, in any study Bible, or you can Google them and find out uh, exactly which ones mean what. But uh, uh, they're all instrumental in, in uh, helping you to understand the Psalms and what the words are alongside of them. For example, one it actually indicates it's to be played or done like dirge, slow, and and a moody kind of a sound. So uh, they're there to help those that uh, were to sing and play these during worship, and that's exactly what the psalms were intended to. And I've been breaking them down into uh, petition, that is a prayer to God asking for something, or information. Uh, instruction, uh, not not that we uh, sh should read them only as historical events in somebody's life that's writing them, but that that information is there for our instruction. Uh, and today's Psalm 53 will be a, a good indicator of what instruction really is all about. Um, and then 
praise, and, and you'll notice in that many of David's psalms, uh, he writes petition, uh, begging God for something and asking for protection and so on, but he winds up in praise uh, because as he thinks about God, he realizes uh, the, the uh, sovereignty of God, the grace and the mercy of God, and winds up praising God. Uh, so we also have some confession from time to time in these, uh, and uh, we find that certainly in Psalm uh, 51 and uh, uh, other Psalms that David has written where he confesses his sin uh, before God. Uh, remember 150 Psalms, 73 attributed to David, 50 to Ezra, and 10 to uh, the son of Korah, 2 to Solomon, one to Moses, one to Heman, and one to Ethan. Uh, some anonymous, they don't know who wrote them and not a good indication of who wrote them. Um, so we have, uh, uh, starting at Psalm 35, a petition, instruction, petition, and praise. Fairly long psalm. Psalm 36 is instruction and praise. Psalm 37 is instruction trust or confidence in God. You want to look particularly at verses 39 and 40 of Psalm 37. And Psalm 38 is petition, confession, and petition. Again, uh, Psalm 39 is instruction and petition. Psalm 40 is uh, trust, instruction, and petition. Psalm 41 is instruction, petition, and praise. Psalm 53, which I'm going to read to you in a moment, is instruction, That's something that we can learn from. And Psalm 58 is instruction, and uh, it's uh, to be done to the tune of do not destroy, although uh, we, <laughs> we don't have the tune for do not destroy anyway, but that's, that was instruction for them as to how it was to be played. Uh, and... Uh, we have Psalm 61, which is trust or confidence in God, praise, and then it's to be played with stringed instruments. Only a few of these uh, indicate what kind of instruments are be played with, or uh, whether it's a soprano that's to sing it, or whether it's to be a dirge, or whatever. Uh, but many of today's practical choruses that we sing in church today uh, come from the Psalms, and you'll recognize certain lines of Scripture in the Psalms uh, that we're singing our praises uh, from these Psalms and from these Scripture verses. So let's take a look then at uh, Psalm 53, an instructional Psalm uh, and a great Psalm. Uh, the superscript above this Psalm 53 is Folly and Wickedness of Men. And it says, for the choir director, according to the Mehla, uh, a mascal of David. And uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, but uh, here's Psalm 53. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And certainly a person that says that is a fool. They are corrupt and have committed abominations and injustice. There is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there's anyone who understands, who seek after God. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Have the workers of wickedness no knowledge who eat up my people as though they were bread? Are they not called? They have not called upon God. There they were in the great fear, where, fe where no fear had been, for God scattered the bones of him who encamped against you. You put them to shame because God had rejected them. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when God restores his captive people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Great Psalm. And uh, we saw in the superscript 
uh, a couple of the terms that I spoke about and how a psalm was to be done. We saw uh, the mascal, which is uh, a, a type of um, hymn, which is a good hymn. And uh, we saw that uh, uh, it was a psalm of David in that superscript uh, that was there at the beginning of Psalm 53. But the heart of it is instruction that the fool says there is no God. And that's why it's an instructional uh, psalm, if you will. And that's how I've categorized it, at least. And I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. I hope that you'll go back and study these psalms, that you'll look at the instruction, the praise, and, and realize that they're to be applied to our lives today just as much as they applied to David's life uh, when they were written. God bless you. Have a great day. Well, if you want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, you need to be sure that you're going to heaven so you can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's easy. That's just admitting that we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God and that we want to turn from sin and self and turn to Jesus alone who lived, who died, and paid the price for our sin. And he became the payment for our sin if we would believe in him and trust in him, repent from our sin. It tells us in the scriptures very clearly the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we can have that by confessing with our mouth and believing in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, that he has the power over death, and that there is literally a place called heaven where our soul can spend an eternity with him. I hope that you'll do that if you've not already done that. And that's my thought. God bless you.